Now, I read also that you lived in Paris for a while. Like after your, I after did. Your, was it after your daughters were born, or was it after your ten years of television before the Miramax writing? All, all true. Yes. Yeah. So I was an actress. Started on all my children. What are you doing here? So far, I know how you feel about me. You. And when I flew out to L.A. to screen test for a pilot with Christopher Lloyd, do you remember him? Mm -hmm. Back to the Future, mm -hmm. Taxi. Mm -hmm. I, I booked this pilot and just fell in love with Los Angeles. And I was able to see that there was so much more work there mm -hmm. at the time. Mm -hmm. If I, in New York, was auditioning for five projects a month, yeah. in L.A. I was auditioning for five projects a day which is a big difference. Right. So I moved to Los Angeles. I worked, 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 married, had two girls, and was still acting. I did the Liberace movie after that. I did 21 Jump Street, Beverly Hills 90210. All of those things were post-children. However, it was getting a little bit harder to navigate. LA is really spread out, if you know it. And my first husband had the opportunity to move to Paris. He's from there. He'd grown up there. Oh, right. He was invited by his mother to come back and help her with the project. She has bilingual Montessori preschools in Paris. Oh, so we. My we, boys went to Montessori. Oh, my girls did too. All of the way course. up to the age of fourteen. Oh, did they? Mm -hmm. well, good for you. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. So I know we have a busy day with the chef and exploring the rest of the Ocean House, but I would love to have a chat with you just about your life story. It's spectacular. It has that a, would be fun. It has a, a lot, talking about a lot of chapters, has a lot of chapters. Indeed. Yeah. It's a book. Yeah. <laughs> it's a book indeed. <laughs> so where, where, where are we? We were in Paris. <laughs> we were in Paris. So I arrived in Paris and, you know, having a lovely young mommy life, but grieving my acting career, realizing that it wasn't really going to happen there. I had this idea at first, you know, my French is pretty good. I majored in French in college, but I, I am not French, mm -hmm. but I thought, oh, could this happen? But clearly it was not in the stars anymore. Yeah. So one night at dinner, I was seated next to this woman, Evie Fullenbach from Canal Plus, the French film studio. Mm -hmm. And I ended up being hired as a reader. And readers are really the port of entry for any written material that goes to a film studio. Yeah. The development department farms it out to readers mm -hmm. and it's, it's piecework. I think I made about $60 a pop, whether I was reading a novel or a screenplay. And I would go to the park with my children or stay home with my children, read the screenplay or book as whatever it was, write a synopsis of it, maybe five page synopsis, and then do a page of coverage, basically saying what I thought worked or did not work about the story and the characters and the yeah. plot and all that. Wow. Because at that time they were doing more English films. They were, in fact. Uh, Canal Plus was a big investor in both British and American films. Well, that doesn't sound like a bad pastime. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it it kind of it works with the children, too, at the same time and keeps your, your, your rich uh, life active, too. I mean, because children... You know, they're beautiful, but sometimes... They're a little bit of a brain drain. <laughs> <laughs> you they said are. it. <laughs> they are. Yeah, I remember thinking, I don't know how many times I can wipe this high chair, honestly. Exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. about when I went back to school, too, uh, just to, you know, jumpstart it again. So it seemed like that was, that was keeping you, and it was work at the same time. So it wasn't like you were just abandoning your children to, to read novels and, and things. Nope. And that was the beginning of my pivot from actress to writer. It was a very slow pivot. Very, very slow. Yeah. And after we were in Paris for a while, my first husband was hired by Julia Roberts to come back to New York and run her development company. Mm -hmm. She had a deal at Disney. We moved back, which was great. And then I was hired by Miramax as their story editor, which is like a book editor at a film company. So those years were kind of my writing school. It was my yeah. graduate intensive program because I had the opportunity to work with you know, the best writers in the business. Right. And, as that, an and that's editor. what they say as a, as a writer, just write, right. And as a reader, just read, <laughs> and as a writer, read. And that's so, true. and so you were, yeah, exactly. Polishing the skills the whole time. And so that thing that seemed like you were grieving the career, this is what happens in our lives. We don't know what that next step is, but this has to inform the next chapter anyway. 
That's absolutely true. Mm. And I think when we're young and we go through crises or loss, we often, first of all, have the perspective that we're the only person to ever go through it, which Mm. of course is not true. And secondly, that the loss outweighs the gain. And that's impossible to know from being in the middle of it. Perspective is amazing. Amazing. And so speaking of perspective, I want to talk about the book. Can we talk about it? I'd love to. <laughs> so um, tell me about the characters. There's some, some initial characters and coming back around to the past life, where we were, what we were doing, the decisions we were making, and then having to become true with that again in the contemporary time. Well said. Finding Mrs. Ford is the story of a woman at a certain stage of her life. She's in her Mm mid-50s. She has lived a life. You don't know when you meet her exactly what that life was. And she does not want you to know. Mm. And I wanted you to meet her right then where all of her armor is fully intact. And she has quite a bit of armor around her. She lives right here in Watch Hill, her summer home. Mm -hmm. She also lives in New York City. And you meet her on a summer day. August of 2014. It happens to be the moment when ISIS is cutting a wide swath over the north of Iraq, which is important. Mm -hmm. The FBI shows up at her house that morning to ask her about an Iraqi man named Sami Fakhouri. And she claims she does not know him. Right, because that's not part of the perfection that she's worked so hard to keep. No, not at all. Oh, yeah. She is white knuckling her life. And you get that feeling very yeah. early on that she's hiding something. And of course, they say to her, well, that's kind of funny that you say that because he took a plane from Baghdad to Boston and we just picked him up in a car on his way to your house. So that's that da 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 moment where you know. What is she hiding? Right. So the finding, Miss, Mrs. Ford, is about literal finding, but also her finding herself. In every way, yeah. we, are, we are looking for her. I also like the alliteration, mm. the two Fs, the finding, mm. Mrs. Ford. I love that movie title, Desperately Seeking Susan. Yes. <laughs> I just love the way it sounded. My agent wanted me to call it Watch Hill. And I understand why she liked that. It Watch Hill could be, as a thriller, kind of a spooky place name, mm. like Lookout Mountain or right. Cape Fear. But I didn't think it really evoked fully what the book is about, which is really a search for this woman. So after you realize she, maybe she's hiding something, mm. that's when you jump cut, to use a film term, back to 1979 when she's a college girl in Detroit, on the edge of Detroit. And I also wanted contrasting places and Mm, eras. mm. And she takes a nice little summer job at a nice little ladies boutique, what we would have called a dress shop back Mm -hmm, then. mm -hmm. And first day she meets Annie Nelson, who is glamorous and sexy and charismatic. And the two girls become unlikely friends. And about a month into their life together at this dress shop, Annie has her big idea that they ditch these respectable jobs and go work as cocktail waitresses at a fairly questionable disco on the edge of Detroit, which Susan knows is a poor life choice, but she does it anyway. And it is in that disco, which is run by three Italian-American brothers, but also heavily patronized by a whole contingent of Iraqi Chaldean men. That's a population in Detroit we can talk about if you want. Mm. And you you get the the setup. What happened in the summer of 1979 Mm -hmm, where mm -hmm. obviously she met him? Mm -hmm. Why is he looking for her 35 years later, which is a long time? And why lie? Why not just say, yeah, I know the guy? And so Annie's character is... um, pulling Susan in different directions that she wouldn't generally go at the time. But for some reason, that dynamic's working. I like that dynamic of Mm. female friendship. I think the most iconic version of that would be Scarlett and Melanie and Gone with the Wind. Everybody hated Scarlett except for Melanie. Why did Melanie like her? Mm. So I think we have that dynamic. There's a fabulous thriller that came out a year or two ago called... uh, 
A Simple Favor mm. with Anna Kendrick and Blake Lively. Similar dynamic. What attracts one woman to another woman? Not in a romantic way, but right. in a friendship way. I would say that female friendship is as magical as romantic love. I mean, you don't become friends with every woman you meet. No, no, sorry. Even if you like them. Right. And sometimes you become friends with a woman that nobody else would computer date you with. So I like playing a little bit yeah. with that dynamic of friendship. So maybe something you're missing in your own life, maybe something that you wish you were more like, something that you admire about that person. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I think that And it's plays reciprocal apart. between the two women, it's reciprocal. Very much so. Mm. And that friendship yeah. and Sammy and everything that happens in the summer of 1979 is what is popping up in her life in 2014, much as she tried to bury it. Yeah. I liked that vast dis distance yeah. of time. Mm. Because I was so interested in Iraq and so interested in the Chaldeans, because there's so many Chaldeans in Detroit, this is a Catholic group from the north of Iraq, okay. Roman Catholic, very unusual, mm. small group, mm. very present in Iraq. Uh, they had a huge uh, classical empire, the Chaldeans, but they, uh, Tariq Aziz, mm. who was Saddam Hussein's foreign minister, he was Chaldean. Mm. So they are an important group there. They are also an important group in Detroit. And when this whole ISIS takeover of the north of Iraq mm. was coming into the news in the summer of 2014, and I was just beginning to work on this book, I thought, that is a really interesting character to have, an interesting background yeah. for a character. And those, those the juxtaposition between the two, the disco in the, <laughs> that time, and then current day, the, the tension that that creates too, and the mystery, the, the reviews about those two settings following one another. Very dramatically yeah. different. Mm -hmm. I love a sense of place in writing, going back to what you said earlier yeah. about this hotel. And I think, to me, Watch Hill and Detroit are characters in the book, very important characters. Nobody would be who they mm. are without those places in which they are living at those times. Yeah. Wow. Well... How, I mean, when you are picturing it as you write, you're picturing all the scenes the entire time. And has it been picked up for a movie yet? Great question. Because you know, even just reading the reviews and I was into it, I was already imagining and picturing the scenes. I have very happy news for you today. Oh. <laughs> I have just signed what is called a shopping agreement mm -hmm. with two Hollywood producers. One of them was an old colleague of mine, my boss at Miramax. Uh, and wow, that comes right around. She's incredible. I hadn't seen her for 25 wow, wow. years and saw her at a book event. Talk about everything happening yeah. as it's meant to happen. Yeah. She and her partner are shopping this around Hollywood right now. They're looking for a studio as either uh, producing it as a feature film or as a TV movie or a tight series like A Big Little Lies. I think there is enough material in it yeah. that it could do a six-parter. In fact, there's more material, of course, yeah. than ended up in the final book. I had actually written a whole section from Sammy's point of view, which is not in the book anymore. And you get attached to that, or was that was it okay? It was okay. Yeah. I mean, it exists. I'm glad I did it. I drove up to Boston and visited the FBI office in Boston, which is still in the book. Mm -hmm. I drove to a prison outside of Boston. So that's your research. Yeah, I did it all. I mm. went, or I didn't go into the prison. Yeah. The prison's not in the book anymore, but because the FBI picks Sammy up right away, yeah. it's not a spoiler to know that he ends up being right. held right. in detention for a while. Mm. So the process, because now I want to picture you, are you writing at a desk overlooking the ocean? Are you writing on the bus, <laughs> on the train? Are well, you writing anywhere that, you can on a napkin? Are you writing, are you typing? I think it's all of the above. So I'm yeah. always making notes, mm -hmm. whether I'm on the bus or the train or bedside. I keep a pad by my bed and I jot down notes in the dark. I try not to turn the light on because <laughs> I don't want to wake up. And whether or not they're and you legible. Can read it, I was going to no, say in the morning. No, it's... If that's a crapshoot. Or you write one note on top of the other note that you're writing on your little piece of paper. So they're like, a, what is that, a palimpsest or 
I think it is. So my process was after I left Miramax, which I, I left because the work was just so demanding. My children were little. I was reading every weekend 12 screenplays and a novel, which is a lot with little children. I started writing on my own, I would say a little bit secretly. I wrote a screenplay. A friend of mine helped me polish that up. We actually got a grant from the Massachusetts Arts Council. Oh, I did read that. In the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And we workshopped it and it was great, but life was taking a different direction. In the course of the Avon Theater, which is the cinema that I still run, I developed a close relationship with Gene Wilder, the actor. And he encouraged you. Yes, he, he did. He encouraged you. He I did, did read that. How nice to have that support. And I, I just had such respect for him. Yeah. And he, at a certain point, we emailed back and forth. And one day he said to me, are you a writer? I think you're a writer. Ooh. I said, oh, gosh, Ooh. maybe. I dabble. Mm. I, and he, <laughs> exactly. And he said, I would be honored to read something you've written. Very generous. Wow. He read the screenplay. Wow was very encouraging. And then over time, he would see me and say, are you writing? I hope you're writing. So for me, it was the mid fifties. When I entered my mid fifties, mm -hmm. children gone from the house. And I said, I have a, an inflection point here, yet another pivot. Will I do this with any seriousness? Mm -hmm. And I had an idea that was percolating and it was this book. And one of the things I decided to do was go public and tell friends I was writing a novel, which absolutely- Courage. But it mortified my husband. <laughs> he thought I was going to embarrass myself. And I- You I mean because of the way that the book would turn out? Or well, just... or that it might not happen. Mm. I don't think he thought that harshly, right, right. but he thought perhaps it was a little too forward to tell people I was doing this yeah. if I didn't really know that I could accomplish it. Because that's the kind of thing that a lot of people will say if you say, oh, I'm, I'm writing a book. Well, people will discourage quickly to say, there's so many people, it's so competitive. You're never gonna blah, 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 you know. This, it, it's hard to find the support of people who say, yes, I- Well, better. there's that. Mm -hmm. And then you also might get to a point a couple of years down the road where people say, hey, how's that book? And you might have to say, mm -hmm. I didn't do anything. But for me, for whatever reason, it turned out to be the right thing to do. Kind well, and of, sometimes just to write it down. Yeah. Sometimes just to get it out of your system. Sometimes just to put it down no matter where it goes is, is part of it. Right. Yeah. So the process began, and it took about a year to have a draft. Mm -hmm. I went to a writer's conference, ended up connecting with two editors who loved the book. I worked with them for another year and got an agent. So we're now two years in. And what I had originally was probably a piece of literary fiction with a doozy of a surprise in the middle. Mm -hmm. And my new agent said, will you bring it more into the realm of thriller? And that became a process of two years of revisions, submissions, wow. rejections, many rejections, until finally we got two offers. So that was now the end of four years. Chose oh. one. And the final year was really the business of getting the book on the market. In that time, I wrote another book mm. as well. So that's what, that was a five-year period to do all that. So you weren't just continuing on trying to get it out and published. You were still continuing the writing. So mm -hmm. you, were, you were true to the new course. I the was. New course. Now, as a child, where did you grow up? Detroit. A uh, suburb of Detroit. Suburb of, yes. and, and how did you play? I often say, like, well, I'll get my, my hair and makeup done, that when I had my dolls, they would, they would fly, they would talk, they had stories, but I never did anything with their hair. I never changed their clothes. Skipper wore the same bathing suit for, you know, 15 years. It doesn't <laughs> even matter. <laughs> I often feel that if you're encouraged to become who you're becoming at a young age, not, not discouraged, that you end up finding that path. So how did you play? Like, That's a great question. For me, all play was fantasy play. I was an only child. I had a tremendous amount of time alone. I read a lot. I would go, we had a rec room in our basement, as many people did with yeah. that, what was that furniture, that uh, rock maple furniture okay. from the 1940s <laughs> that had belonged to my father. We had that in the basement. Yep. Mm -hmm. But we had this 1940s set of encyclopedias. So mm -hmm. I would sit and read the encyclopedia and 
All play was fantasy play. I played stories and movies and characters. I remember, you know, Mary Poppins with the umbrella <laughs> trying to jump off the picnic table. Didn't work ever. <laughs> I did the same thing um, as a young girl with a, a bubble umbrella mm-hmm. and jumped off the front fence. Right. It was, it was just, a, you know, it was for about this high. Yeah. Climbed right up the top. See through the, remember the umbrellas where I you do. could go all the way down, you could see do. through them? Yes. Jumped right down there, being the same. <laughs> Didn't work. Mm-hmm. So I did play with dolls, yeah. but everything was really fantasy based. I yeah. lived in a neighborhood, post war suburban neighborhood where kids were outside all the time. So yeah. there were a lot of block wide games and yeah. tag games and, and all of that. But my, my sweet spot was really all of the fun yeah. makeup stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had one, one game I used to play with uh, one of my friends was uh, Blind Man's Bluff. And I do think it's kind of indicative of who I am in some ways. Because what we would do, I would say maybe you know, eight, nine-year-old, something like that. We'd blindfold each other, spin each other, take turns spinning each other around, and then walk through the neighborhood. And we would walk the other wow. person very far away. And I remember thinking... I'm listening to the leaves and I'm I'm feeling the sun on my, and trying to feel where I was at the time. So that kind of groping in the dark Mm -hmm. is something that is a process that I really enjoy, actually. I really do enjoy the unfolding of things. That's fantastic. I love that. Mm. So the new thriller is Mm -hmm. called Ruby Falls, and it is the story of a little girl whose name is Ruby, who finds herself in a cave in Tennessee called Ruby Falls, with her father in 1968. She's six years old. And in Ruby Falls, they turn off the lights. It's what they do. And there is a waterfall falling. And little Ruby is paralyzed with fear because she Mm. cannot tell where this waterfall is. And in the midst of all of her trying to stay as still as she can, so she doesn't step into the water, her father lets go of her hand. And when the lights come on, he's gone, completely vanished. So they don't know if he's fallen in the water or he's hightailed it out of there, if he's been kidnapped. Nobody knows what happened to him. By the end of the day, the police get her and the mother has to come retrieve her. And they're grounded in Chattanooga, Tennessee for the rest of the summer, dealing with the aftermath of this. 20 years later, she is an actress. Uh, She has gotten rid of the name Ruby and she just goes by Eleanor Russell. And she's written out of a soap opera under somewhat questionable circumstances. I know. Isn't that funny? You don't know why she was written out, Mm -hmm. but precipitously she goes to Europe. She meets a man and marries him on the spot. And his name is Orlando Montague, which is a great kind of gothic (laughs) name. And he is British, Mm -hmm. but he is Anglo-Chinese. So Mm -hmm. he's rather exotic and gives this interesting backstory. They go to Rome on their honeymoon. They are about to go into the catacombs under the earth. And she, of course, has an attack of claustrophobia after what happened in her childhood. All starts coming back. It all comes back. Mm. And she realizes that about that moment, she should tell Orlando what happened to her Mm. that summer. But she doesn't. So she begins her marriage with a secret. Of course, they move to Los Angeles. They get a perfect cottage in the Hollywood Hills picket fence, roses, perfect. And she is cast in a remake of the Hitchcock film, Rebecca. Remember the Daphne du Maurier book? Wow. And life starts to get strange and Orlando starts to change. And of course, he is maybe not who he pretended to be either. So that's Ruby Falls. Wow. Wow. And so after you have a book... And now a movie deal, almost-ish, kind of. The confidence level to just get into that next one and know that you're, I mean, that's your history, is, is moving forward. Is moving forward. That this is what you're doing. This is who you are now. Yes. I'm working on a third one. My mother's... At the same time? Yes. My mother's best friend was uh, murdered in Pittsburgh in 1948 when she really? and the girl were 12 years old. Really? Wow. And if you think about the book or movie Mystic River, mm-hmm. which has to do with an act of violence that mm-hmm. just never ends, it affects people right. later, surrounding, next generation. Right. That has what happened to my mother one step away from this girlfriend of hers. 
affected her, affected me, has affected my daughters. Right. Resonated. Ripples. Yes, very much so. They say that in yoga. Yes. That whatever prior injury or wherever you're holding in there is always there. I think there's way. a Sanskrit word for it, samskara, which are like psychic scars. Mm. So I'm playing around right now with the idea of a woman now in the modern era mm -hmm. who's fixated with, I don't know if I want to use the true story, it's, and it's an unsolved crime, mm. which adds to that difficulty of yeah. letting it go. But is your mother still alive? My mother is still alive. And does she know that, that yes. you're considering this? Yeah. She's a great So source. that's not one of your reasons for not creating that story, is that? Not no, might... and I know the case was reopened mm -hmm. about 12, 13 years ago. There was enough as evidence to reopen the case. Mm -hmm. They had hoped to have intact DNA in, the, in their property room. It happened in Pittsburgh. Yeah. They had a, a box of fabric and had hoped to have an intact sample, but it wasn't. Yeah. It was old, 60 years old at that point. So I'm playing with that. Wow, play. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> wow, well... What a great conversation. Thank you so much for your time. We have a dinner party to put on. We have a chef. We have lots of things left to do today, but um, best to you. Thank you. What a privilege. It was a treat for me. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's a beautiful story. Stories. <laughs>